said before, is a huge friend to MBBI, uh, presented at our private equity forum up in Wisconsin, which had about 150 people there at our January conference he presented. We had quite a few people there. And uh, he and I, uh, conceptually, and, and Ralph had the same thought process when we were up in Wisconsin, <clears throat> conceptually had the idea to start to educate business owners as a um, way to create more deals within MBBI. The work is revenue growth. The average growth is 10 to 20 percent in year one, which is annualized. Um, so they keep growing forever. Uh, the approach is incredibly simple. Uh, it uh, doesn't take a lot of time, and it doesn't cost any money to do. And the reason it's all those things is because I wanted to uh, whittle away any possible items of resistance uh, for these people that we're trying to teach, which is the salespeople, the customer service people, the managers, the vice presidents. Um, because everybody on the planet resists change. Nobody wants to do new stuff. Nobody wants to learn new stuff, uh, unless it is a young workforce um, who is still growing their careers. And what did you say, 83% of people are thinking about their next job, right? Are thinking they're going to look for a job in, in the next year. And so we made it a part of our project, our system, our process, to increase the uh, two to three hours to 10, 10 a week. Still not much, two hours a day from 30 minutes or something. And we did that. And his sales are running 175% to last year. It's a $60 million business. It's pretty interesting. It's a big increase. All because they went from two hours to 10. And I said to him, Joe, make it 15, man. Make it 20. This is a gold mine, a gold mine for you. Want to grow a business? Communicate with customers more. Very complicated. Average customers only wear 20% of what you do. Um, that means they cannot buy the other 80%. They might want to. They might buy it from the competition. Um, you would certainly like to sell it to them. And there's a great chance they already buy it. That's a really important point to make. They buy it from the competition. They would like to buy it from you, but they can't. Because they don't know. Not their fault. It's not really our fault either, because we don't think that they don't know. We're thinking about it all day long, right? We're marinating on our stuff all the time, so we assume that they know too. They don't. I don't know. So pivot to the sale. People are afraid of offending when they offer to help people more. And that's the psychology. That's the psychological crap that I try to get around. I don't want to talk to the brain, I want to talk to the spinal cord. That's why these things take 45 seconds. And that's why when my clients have a workshop with me, that's the beginning, it's never the end. It's the beginning. And we, we stay with people usually uh, for, for three months to about a year and a half after that point. And we build a habit, it has to become a habit. When it's a habit, your brain's not doing it anymore. Now it's your spine. But the CEO comes out with the note, brings it to the guy and says, listen, if you didn't send this, we'd be done with you. But he goes, this note, made it from the person you sent it to all around the office, and it really assuaged some negative feelings that people had. It really helped, like more than you could even imagine. And it ended up my desk, and there it sat for a month until he came in for the meeting. That's the power of a handwritten note. What do you say in the note? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, because I asked him the same question, and if I remember correctly, he uh, expressed his appreciation for them as a customer. He apologized again. Uh, he's let them know that he'll, he'll work his ass off to make it up to them in, in future business. And, you know, it was, it, was, uh, it, was, it was half of one of these. You know, it was, yeah. this was the size of the paper, because I asked him all these things. Um, so how long did it take? He goes, three minutes. I said, how much of that 10 million do you make, do you get to keep? You know? It's a pretty cool handwritten note, years later. He said that in our research, uh, perseverance and resilience are twice as impactful as talent, as natural talent. And so another way of saying that is, perseverance and resilience are two-thirds of the equation to success. And talent, being good at something, is only one-third. So trying again, you know, back to the Thomas Edison quote, um, making the extra effort when you get a no, giving people another opportunity to say yes, uh, is two-thirds of the formula. That's the rate to turn me stop trying again.
So I grow companies. Uh, my typical client is uh, 100 million to 500 million dollars. Uh, I have done this work with much smaller companies as well. I've done this work with five to 10 million dollar companies. I've done it with 25 million dollar companies. But my typical client is 100 to 500 million. Um, the work is revenue growth. The average growth is 10 to 20 percent in year one, which is annualized. Um, so they keep growing forever. Uh, the approach is incredibly simple. Uh, it uh, doesn't take a lot of time, and it doesn't cost any money to do. And the reason it's all those things is because I wanted to uh, whittle away any possible items of resistance uh, for these people that we're trying to teach, which is the salespeople, the customer service people, the managers, the vice presidents. Um, because everybody on the planet resists change. Nobody wants to do new stuff. Nobody wants to learn new stuff. Uh, unless it is a young workforce um, who is still growing their careers. And what did you say, 83% of people are thinking about their next job, right? Or thinking they're going to look for a job in, in the next year. Uh, and so those people are still interested in growth. But if they're over the age of 40, almost always, uh, it's, you know, we're good. We, we, we've got it. We're okay now. We're okay the way. So the owner says, I want you to change. And the staff says, eh, no, thanks. You know? Um, so I made it doable in 45 seconds at a time. Uh, I made it incredibly simple. Uh, most of my uh, clients say to me, uh, I can't believe how easy this is, but I'm mad that I wasn't doing this already. Uh, and I take that as a great compliment. That's my goal, that's my point, that's what I was hoping for. And then the third thing is, it costs no money, so they can't say we don't have the budget. So basically there's absolutely no reason for these business owners to do it. Okay, so as you watch this, think about the possibility of gathering some of your business owners together, some of your clients, and doing a session like this for them, um, and helping them, just like this. So no selling for me, uh, at just pure value. We'll give them a book, uh, and uh, you'll look really good, and we'll talk about growing their business. All right. So I should take one thing back. I think everybody here owns a business. So right. I, I don't mean to say that business owners didn't come. Everybody here owns a business. I meant to say two people that are outside of MDBI that were business owners additionally signed up. So everyone here in their, uh, either is a you know, singly owned company or have employees that work for them. Um, so Correct. everybody here is a business owner. Great. Um, so that's good to know. Yeah, so one to clarify. Good. <laughs> Um, I guess I'll start with a story that happened to me last week. Uh, a client was at a national association event that I spoke at last year. Uh, this is a, uh, a, a lumber distribution and manufacturing association. So I work in very sexy industries like sawmills and pipes and valves and so forth. Um, and the client is talking to a prospect. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the client's been working with me for about six months. The prospect uh, has talked to me many times about working together, but hasn't quite pulled the trigger yet. And the prospect is uh, asking the client all about what it's like to work with me. And uh, the client says to the prospect, how many hours a week would you guess your salespeople spend on the phone? And the prospect thinks about it, that's a lot of hours. The client says, how many? Take a guess. He says, 20 hours a week. Client says, I'll bet you a steak dinner, it's less than that. It's not 20 hours. He didn't know, but he's, from his experience, from the work that we did for him. Prospect says, okay, I'll go check, and then we'll reconnect before, the, before this meeting ends. Next day, and I got the story from both of them. The client told me the story, and the prospect told me the story separately, two separate phone calls. The next day, the prospect is chasing after the client in the hallway in between sessions. He says, I found out how much they talk on the phone. Client says, how much? He says, four hours a week. Four hours a week? Four hours a week. He guessed 20, <laughs> ended up being four. Uh, these people work for 45 hours a week. It's their job to sell. They're salespeople. It's their job to sell lumber. Sell some lumber. That's your job. That's what we pay for. They are on the phone four hours a week out of 45. Four hours a week uh, is not even an hour a day. It's embarrassing. Client starts telling the prospect our story. Uh, he thought, it was also far too high, but he, we found out his salespeople uh, at my client's company were only on the phone two to three hours a week. Also 45 hour weeks. And so we made it a part of our project, our system, our process, to increase 
the uh, two to three hours to ten. Ten a week. Still not much. Two hours a day. From 30 minutes or something. And we did that. And his sales are running 175% to last year. It's a $60 million business. It's pretty interesting. It's a big increase. All because they went from two hours to 10. And I said to him, Joe, make it 15, man. Make it 20. This is a gold mine. A gold mine for you. Want to grow a business? Communicate with customers more. Very complicated. What were they doing the rest of the time? <laughs> e you acquire email. They default to email. Everybody wants to email instead of phone because the rejection is less personal. Okay. Uh, it's less scary to do email. Um, and they were browsing the internet an awful lot. They were looking at ESPN and, and, and other stuff. And they were saying they were on the, it's not really the owner's fault. They were telling the owner and the managers that they were on the phone a lot more. They were, you know, they, but what they didn't know is he has a system we can see. I'm not sure he knew that either. And then he found out from the IT guy that he has such a system. <laughs> <laughs> so where we start with clients is, look, if you want to grow a business, communicate with people more. That's how simple this is. Um, the more that people hear from us, customers and prospects, and I want you guys to think about everything I'm saying today from your perspective and growing your business and also from the perspective of your customers and clients, okay? Because the goal is to grow their business so that you can sell it for more, so that you can make more money, right? At the uh, January meeting, you and I went through an exercise. If uh, you have a $10 million client, $10 million business, and they grow at my low number, which is a million dollars in the first year. A million dollars is worth to the intermediary how much? Well, uh, you got to take a multiple, but a million dollars, uh, you <clears throat> look at the cash flow, so let's say they have $300,000 of additional cash flow. 30%. Times a three multiple would be 900 grand, times a four multiple, a million two, you know, and so on and so forth. And so they, they, they typically get, and I'm just guessing, but I think it's like 10%, uh, may get lower as the deal goes up, but let's use 10% as a number. Okay. So that's a $90,000 to $100,000 increase, right? Okay. Client says, well, where does the growth come from? I said, why do you care? It's growing. It's growing. We're doing 12 different things. Who cares which one exactly it is? It's growing. Be happy. Um, okay. So let's pick a client that sends proposals or quotes. Okay. Um, okay. Got it. So, so how big is that one? That's 10 to 11 million. Okay. So we'll call it $10 million. Yeah. And what do they do? That's, uh, that's software. Software code. Yes. And how many quotes or proposals do they send out? 20 to 30. A month? Yes. Okay. So 20 to 30 quotes or proposals per month. Right. And how many close would you guess? 10%? 5 to 10. 5 to 10. So let's use 10%. So let's say uh, 2 or 3 close. But uh, 17 stay open. Now, the 17 that stay open, these people asked for a proposal. They asked for a proposal. Your client sent them a proposal. And almost always, these 17 are silent. You don't know why they're saying no. They're just saying no. You're emailing them, you're calling them, but you don't hear anything back from them. Because people would rather not say no and avoid that discomfort than actually say sorry we decided it's not for us, or it's too expensive, or we went with somebody else. People don't want that discomfort as a customer, so we avoid it. So these 17 are silent. So I teach a quote follow-up process, proposal follow-up. Three communications. My typical client closes 20% of these unclosed quotes. So this would add three more closed proposals. So in this client's example, you go from two to three closing in a month to six closing in a month. What's a typical proposal worth, do you know? Uh, 300,000. Okay, 300. So we've just added a million dollars a month, which probably doubles their size. Okay. Quote follow-up. If you think the quote follow-up is, is complicated, here are the three emails that I teach my clients to send. And I, I, everything's in the book. Everything we talk about is in the book. Um, here are the three emails. Email one comes within 24 hours of the proposal. And it says, 
Tom, did you get the proposal? These things get to, uh, tend to get picked off by spam filters, ironically enough, right, Mr. Blacklist? Yeah. Um, <laughs> they tend to get picked off by spam filters. I want to make sure it got to you. You asked me for it. I want you to know I sent it. It's a PDF. It's probably in your spam filter if you haven't got it. So it's one line. Did you get it? Check the spam. Done. Second email. If you still haven't heard from it. Tom, I got you the proposal. Haven't heard from it. Where are you at on this? One line. Send that out. Uh, the third email, now if, if they've responded, stop the process. Don't keep following up. But if they haven't responded yet, send a third email that says, Tom, listen, proposal's about to expire. File's going to close. Not I'm expiring, not I'm closing the file, but it's going to expire. It's expiring. It's going to close. Uh, unless I hear from you in 24 hours. I followed up twice. This is the third one. Uh, I'm assuming you're not interested. So this is all going closer. Um, hope we can come together on something in the future. So no phone calls, nothing? Just three emails? That would be the third email. I send, you send it off, and uh, sometimes people will come back and say, no, 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 wait, 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 not yet. But the clients that substitute the second email with a phone call, because I've tested it both ways, mm. they close 30% of their unplus proposals. 30% if you replace one email with a call. The reason I like emails, once again, in this case, not, almost never else except for this, is uh, people don't resist it. They don't have time. So what I've done in clients is I've put a person, we've had we have a $10 an hour admin sitting at the front desk. Uh, every quarter proposal that goes out, she gets copied on. Goes on the calendar, immediately you schedule the three follow-ups on her calendar, immediately. And she does it. And magically business guy happens. Why? Because these people are now hearing from you that you care. I did a, uh, we moved to Lake Forest a year and a half ago, and there was a drafty area in the family room. And so I called some insulation people. Well, I've never dealt with insulation people before. And I called them, and three of them came to the house and ran their tests and sealed it up, you know, and blew the big fan. I don't know if you guys have ever seen this. It's a whole process. Um, I got three proposals, actually. And only one guy followed up with me. Guess who got the business? Guy who followed up. Guess who was the most expensive? Guy who followed up. Guy who followed up actually said to me, send me the other proposals. I'll give you some feedback on it. I did it. I don't care. He was the only one talking to me. I'm not going to have three more people at the house waste my time again. He's the only one to talk to me. He got the job. Um, and he did it well. Many of my clients tell me, and when we debrief these things, which we do a lot, they tell me that I followed up on the quote, and I didn't get that one. But I got another opportunity just because I was in front of them. By dint of caring enough to follow up, they uncovered another opportunity. Customer says, not that one. That one's a no-go. But what about this other thing that I'm working on? Can you help me with that? See how that works? And so I teach my clients, this is not a... I'm going to turn this off. Um, I don't think I'm going to use that. This is not us bothering them. This is not us um, taking their time. This is not us asking them for their money. You're not bugging them. You're not stepping on their toes. You're just helping them. That's all you're doing. You're just helping them more. That's it. And so when you follow up on your quote or your proposal, you demonstrate to people that you care enough to try again, to follow up. Do you guys have opportunities that could be followed up on that are just kind of hanging out there? <laughs> um, sometimes, yeah. So, uh, what's the Thomas Edison quote, which, which is one of my, probably my favorite quote in the world. He says, uh, most of life's failures did not realize how close they were to success when they gave up. Isn't that cool? Just an extra effort away. A little perseverance. A little perseverance. I mean, all of you can think of times in your, in your lives and in your careers where if you didn't make another effort, you wouldn't have had that thing that you got, that you accomplished. It wouldn't have happened. But because you made multiple extra efforts, uh, it's like Tom Thibodeau, he was the coach here at the Bulls. Things have gone considerably downhill since then. Um, but, but he would say, you know, it, it's, it's consistent multiple efforts. That's really what it boils down to. That's it. Um, and people give up. People don't follow up on proposals because they are afraid of hearing no. They prefer silence to no. 
They prefer not knowing and still having it as a maybe because they perceive the no as rejection. So the psychology is I'd rather avoid the rejection and hear nothing than follow up and make an extra effort. Well, the practical fact is that when you follow up, you might close the sale. You might not close the sale and find out why. So you'll learn something. And you might get additional opportunities. Now, some of those still stay silent. They won't respond to three. And they're just being rude, I think, at that point. They're being jerks. You've communicated three times. They've asked you to write a proposal that you wrote. And now you've asked them three times. And they haven't responded. And so they're just being rude people. That's not your problem. They're a buyer. They're not buying. That's not your problem. I have a business mentor who does a great job with this. He says to me, if, they, if, if I can't get a buying decision here, not my problem. Their job is to buy. They're the buyer. You did everything you could do. You did it right. At that point, if they don't buy, it's not your problem. It's their problem. That's the boldness that this requires. And a lot of the salespeople at your clients' uh, companies, they don't think that way. Let's consider the typical salesperson's day. When do they hear from their customers? When the customers are happy? Or when the customers need something? When do they hear? Customer needs something. Something's wrong. There's a problem. You've screwed it up. You got me the wrong damn product. It's not what we talked about. My guys are standing around. Right? Union people at $150 an hour. Standing around. Don't have the part. Get the part. Sales guy gets in the car at 2 in the morning. Drives it over. You guys know these stories. My client called me a pipe on the south side here. Um, <coughs> Third generation family business, um, large company, one of the larger uh, pipe and valve distributors in the country. They, uh, one of their sales guys, we wrote up a case study about it. One of their sales guys got a call in the middle of the night when they were redoing Wrigley Field's uh, bathrooms uh, right before the season started last, last season. Remember the bathrooms were closed at the beginning of the year and there were, there were lines all around Wrigley Field? So the bathrooms that got opened got opened because Columbia Pipe's customer got the part from the sales guy in the middle of the night. Got in the car, drove it over, drove the parts over. Here they, they got the wrong parts from the other supplier. So Columbia Pipe got in the car and said, here you go. And so Wrigley, Wrigley might not have opened on time that year if they didn't have the right valves in their stupid toilets that they had all off season to do. So, so the typical salesperson's day getting yelled at, things are on fire, um, we need it now. When they call for the first time, they need it yesterday. You know, nobody ever calls when they need something six months from now. They only call when they need it immediately, because they're busy. So the salesperson reacts to these things constantly, and they're constantly putting out fires, dealing with fires, right? All day long. And when they resolve one customer's problem, what happens? The next one. And they resolve that one, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And all day long, they spend working in the business, in your words. In my language, I call that reactive work. It's reactive work, it's how they spend their lives, how most of you spend your lives. And then there's proactive work, which is the work that's required to grow revenue. And the problem is most people spend their days, all of their days, reactively. Sales growth requires proactive work. We must make time for it. We've got to make time for it. it. Won't happen on its own. Now you might grow if you spend your life reactively in business. You might grow that year. Possible. Depends on which concerns come in for your customers. But you're bouncing around like a pinball from one fire to the next. Whatever comes in is the concern that you're going to deal with and address. And if those concern happen, concerns happen to be growing concerns to help your business grow, and you happen to address those, your business will grow. But next year, it might not happen again that way. So you can't plan for that growth. That's not strategic growth. So we must make time for it. We don't need to make a lot of time for it. We don't need to make an hour a day. We don't need to make even half an hour a day. We need like 15 minutes. We might even need less than that. 
we need to really, all we really need to do is to take one proactive communication action per day to grow business. That's it. One proactive communication action per day. That's it. So, revenue growth requires <coughs> systematically communicating to people who can buy from you. Systematically communicating to people who can buy from you. On two tracks. sell me is 100%, what do I consciously know about that I can buy from you? Not what you might have told me three months ago or six months ago, but what do I, what your average customer is aware of, how much of all of what they can buy from you? What's the number? Let's go around the table. Jeff? 15%. 20 yeah. Across all companies in all industries, there actually, the actual number, as I've studied it, is 20%. So you guys are all good. Um, except for the one. <laughs> um, I've got, I've got it. Great. He's in an yeah, life is good for you. I've got a great do you know example. Okay, go. Every, every year I go to conferences and I, I send out invitations to meet one-on-one -on -one with identified. And over time, the number of responses I've been getting goes down. And my communication to them traditionally has been, this is what we do. So this year I changed it to a big conference for essentially said, did you know we're currently working on engagements in these three marketplaces? Nice. It's good, did you know? Okay. Two weeks ago, I'm totally booked. Because of that one question? Yeah. Because did, did you email I, it? I, yeah. I changed, I changed it up, and, and now they're engaged because they know that I'm working in something that the ones who respond, yeah. they must be interested in those markets. Imagine, uh, Asking a did you know question once a week, you'd have to start hiring people. Tool. <laughs> Imagine uh, your clients asking did you know questions like that too. So average customers only aware of 20% of what you do. Um, that means they cannot buy the other 80%. They might want to. They might buy it from the competition. Um, you would certainly like to sell it to them. And there's a great chance they already buy it. That's a really important point to make. They buy it from the competition. They would like to buy it from you, but they can't because they don't know. Not their fault. It's not really our fault either because we don't think that they don't know. We're thinking about it all day long, right? 
we're marinating on our stuff all the time, so we assume that they know too. They don't. They don't know. Because they're busy too. They're not thinking about your offerings. How many times have you been sitting with a customer and uh, you're talking about your work and the customer says, I didn't know you guys did that. And you say to him, we talked about it last month. I know it was you because we were on the phone together. And you, you said the same thing actually a month ago. You said, I didn't know you did that. So just because you told somebody something doesn't mean they know. It's fascinating. Just because you told them doesn't mean they know. So the point is, that, and this is a really big point, is it's impossible to over-communicate. You cannot over-communicate. There is no over-communication. You cannot saturate somebody with what they can buy from you. It's impossible because it doesn't sink in most of the time. It simply has to sink in at the moment that they need it. And if you happen to be in front of them at that moment, then they'll buy it. That's why, quote, follow-up, that's why systematic did you know questions. Uh, that's why my clients get new and different opportunities when they follow up on a quote. Because they happen to be there at the time that this person is thinking about it. And so, how many sales slash customer service people do they have? Ballpark? Wrong numbers? 30. 30. So they have 30 people. And if you were to guess, these are customer-facing people. And if you were to guess, right? If you were to guess how many phone calls a day do these people take or make in, a, in an average day? And I know you're guessing, so just give me your honor. Five a day? All right, it's probably going to be closer to, to um, 10 to 20, but we can use five. We'll use your example. Because again, the exact number really doesn't matter. It's interesting no matter what the number is. So five phone calls, so these are calls a day. Make or take now. Only five? Ten. Ten? And you're like the, the sawmill, you know, two hours a day, two hours a week. <laughs> Ten calls. How many emails do you think they they send in a given day? Yeah, it's almost always more than it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a multiplier factor more. Multiple, multiple, multiple. Um, it's a factor higher than than the calls. So uh, fifty. So this is um, sixty communications per person. Uh, at 30 people, this equals uh, 1,800 communications per day, if my math is right, right? 1,800 communications per day is, uh, let's call it 9,000 exactly per week. And at 52 weeks, just for round numbers, um, what? 500,000. Yeah, we'll just go to 500,000, right? Just for round numbers. 500,000 communications per year, okay? And that's with 30 people. So, and typical numbers, 10 and 50 is a typical number because I did this exercise with everybody. If everybody asks the did you know question on every communication, then um, the average number of did you know questions close. So if you're a customer of mine, and we're talking on the phone, and you're calling me to place an order, and you're ordering carbon fiber, what? Give me a product example. It's just raw material that they use in manufacturing. A length of something, yeah. right? So now you say, listen, did you know we make these other lengths, by the way? And what about fastening them together, right? What about tying them together? Complementary products, right? So you're buying this length. By the way, we also have these other lengths. The average percentage close of those did you know questions is 20%. And let's even call it a line item. Let's not say it's a new set. Let's say it's a line item. So what percentage, excuse me, what's the dollar amount of the typical line item? Take a guess. Ballpark. It's $80. Per line, not per order. Right. How big is this company? Yeah. OK. Oh, now we're dealing with something. Nice line item. <laughs> um, so, so if we have eight, I'm going to need your calculator. Here. If we have eighty thousand dollars per line, twenty percent, maybe I'm wrong. Twenty percent of five hundred thousand is a hundred thousand. One hundred thousand dy case closed. So add five zeros to that. What do you get? Is that a billion? 
about double the company. More than 80 million. It's either 800 million or, or 8 billion. Is it 8 billion? So we've grown the company a little bit. So let's say, so now this is, so we, let, let's just, we'll get to 8 billion dollars, okay? Let's just say, so we live in the real world and we know that not everybody will remember to ask the did you know question every time. We know that. But if only 20% of the time they remember to ask the did you know question, Take 20% of 8 billion, right? 10% of 8 billion is what? Yeah, 80 million. 800. 800. Fine, let's call it 800 million. That's 10%. 10% remember to ask. You've got 800 million in your revenue doubling size. Instantly. That's the did you know question. Now, what we do is we automate the did you know question. It goes into the signatures of everybody's emails, it goes into the signatures. You know the book Automatic Millionaire? Put money aside and not even think about it, and all of a sudden you look at your account and it's skyrocketing. I want to take uh, the as as a as a great sports psychologist uh, who I've worked with knows as he says, he says, I want to take the brain out of it. I just want to talk to the spinal cord. I just want to talk to the automatic. I want to make it automatic. So take the thinking out of it. I want to take the decision making out of it. I want to take the the, the psychological crap that everybody has. And I want to go around it. I want to move around it straight to action. And if it's in everybody's email, then you know that all 50 of these are going to have the did you know question in. So put it in your did you know question. Put it in your signature. Oh, can you change that? Well, my clients will write up like 20 or 30 or 50. And they, you know, it has to be, every email has to have one, so they just pick one. And if they pick the wrong one, who cares? <laughs> it's still there. Again, it doesn't matter. Oh, we don't know where it comes from. Who cares? Business is up 15%. You're happy? Yes, we're happy. That's what's, what's in yours? Did you just say, did you know my average client's revenues grew 15% last year? No, I would say, did you know that uh, I do keynote speeches uh, three times a month? Or I would say, did you know that I run peer groups uh, for uh, companies that are five million or less? who can't afford a full project with them. So I, I talk about all the different things that people can buy from. This is what I mean. It's simple. It's uh, fast, because this requires no time. Literally no time. It's in your email signature. And on the phone, it's 45 seconds on an existing conversation. So then we get into technique. Uh, 
Um, so every week they fill out a, um, a plan. Some of you have seen this before. Every week they fill out a plan. And the planner says, Monday through Friday, I'm going to take these actions. And they forward it to their manager. <clears throat> their manager forwards it to his manager. And then it ends up at the owner and I, and our email. And at the end of the week, they write down how it all went. And they forward it again. The managers give feedback. So there's a constant communication going on. The owner gives feedback. Uh, one of my clients picks, now this is recent, it's their idea, now I'm implementing for everybody. They pick an outstanding action item of the week. Uh, I work with a company called Beaver Lumber in Michigan, uh, one of the top uh, sawmills in the country. And their general manager goes through everybody's actions and uh, sends out a congratulations to the one employee who happens to be that week's winner. And they get a $25 Tim Hortons gift card. That's the reward. And it moves people to action. We recognize people. You know that people, this is interesting for you guys. You know that uh, people are more motivated by recognition among their peers than they are by money? Meaning, if you offer somebody a raise here and over here, you recognize them among their peers. And you say, great job, that was awesome. Way to go, I appreciate your, your work and your service. This is going to drive them much more than the raise. That's why the $25 gift card, doesn't matter. It could be a $100 gift card, it'd be just as effective. It could be a $1,000 gift card, just as effective, same thing, doesn't matter. It's the recognition that matters. So we use that psychology to our benefit. And we recognize people systematically. Systematically, we ask them to do work, and systematically, we recognize them. Uh, the ones that are performing well, and then if there's uh, trouble people, if there's B players, we uh, recognize them as well. And we say to them, look, you're kind of at the bottom of the list here, in front of everybody. Uh, my clients send out scorecards. And the scorecard is an Excel spreadsheet that lists all the staff and shows which actions they've taken. And that the last column is how many, how many actions they've taken of these communications actions that we've taught them. How many have they taken? And over the course of time, there's a running total of what it should be. 100% is this number. And we stack rank people. And so the people at the top are recommended. And the people at the bottom want to do everything they can to get the hell out. They don't want to be there. And they should be recognized for being terrible. They shouldn't fly under the radar. What happens with this work is people reveal themselves to the owner. People reveal themselves. They will either, uh, you know, there's really two choices. One is, I give a shit, and you want to do this, so I will do this for you because you care and it's important. And the other choice is, I don't give a shit. And they make themselves known. And I even go through a process with owners where we anticipate who the resistors might be before this even begins. Who do you think will resist this the most? This is in your world. Because they know. They know who's good and who's not. They know. And the resistors are almost always um, with the company forever, uh, nearing retirement, living off sales they made 20 years ago, still getting paid for them, haven't made a new damn sale in 20 years, literally, but just doing repeat business. Um, and they say that we don't need this. We're good. You know? I've been doing this for 30 years. I know something about this one. You know? I know better than the owner. Yeah, we're good. Um, and so the owner has a conversation with that person and brings them in and says, listen, here's what we're going to do. I need your leadership on this. So we, we take, we literally guide people through it. And once this launches, using these planners as a tool, which are rarely paper, they're um, either fillable PDFs or they're spreadsheets that we create for the managers. And there's tabs on the bottom for every one of the people. Or it's just in their CRM. Uh, I have clients that put it on the Google Drive where everybody's is. It's a spreadsheet, but it's on the Google Drive in, in the sky. Referrals. Referrals are, um, listen, Tom, who else do you know? Honest question, Tom. Who do you know, business owner-wise, that uh, could benefit from working with somebody like me, from this kind of process? 
Everyone. Specifically. Um, One example. I'd like to uh, let, let him know I'll be calling and introduce us, or can I just call and use your name? Um, yeah, or I'd, I'd be more than happy to send an email and copy you and introduce you uh, Great. as well. Think you'll have time this week? Uh, sure, I can do it tomorrow. Great, thank you very much. Um, that was a role play, that was an example. And uh, here are some takeaways from it. Tom, who do you know that could benefit in working with me? Not do you know somebody, which is a yes or no question, but who do you know that could benefit from this kind of thing? And then, I don't know if you noticed, I stood here quietly and I listened and I waited and I gave him time to think. And for a long time there was a rather uncomfortable silence while he thought of something. And he did it quickly. Um, and Tom and I know each other pretty well, but I do this with strangers in the audience too. Um, but I was not going to be the first one to speak under any circumstance. He's not thinking about referrals for, for me before I ask the question, right? So it's only fair to give him time to consider who he might know because he wasn't thinking about this a second ago. And so the key to asking and getting a referral is the silence that comes after the question. The power of the pause. It's just shutting up and letting the person think like a human being, because that's the, that's the reasonable thing to do. You weren't thinking about it a minute ago. Now, if you would have struggled, I was close to helping you. So the next step is, if, if the person says, I don't know, I can't, or I'll think about it and I'll let you know. Sure you will. You're, you'll never think of it again, right? And we both know that. And you're just looking for a way out. Which I understand, because it's human. But if somebody says, I don't know, or I'll think about it, or I'm not sure, help them. And say, Tom, look. I work with business owners, uh, typically manufacturers or distributors, 50 million and up, sometimes 25. Now, who do you know like that? And I try again, and I shut up again, and I listen. And here are the statistics. One third will give you a referral on the first effort, one third. As long as you stay quiet, if you ask for who do you know, and then you shut up. One third will give you a referral on the first time. On the second effort, another one third will magically think of somebody. So now you're getting a referral two-thirds of the request that you're asking. Ask for a referral. Number three, and I teach this to this step. Have you ever been in a social setting where um, somebody says, do you have a chiropractor or a lawn service or a painter or whatever random thing they need, right? And there's five people standing in a circle. And everybody says, you got to use my guy. My guy's the best. My guy does it better than anybody. And people literally trip over themselves to give you a referral right. for this provider. Trip over themselves. People are happy to refer business, as long as they're happy with us. So you don't do this to an angry customer. It won't work. <laughs> but if it's a happy customer, if it's a happy customer and you ask, who else do you know that would benefit like you're benefiting right now? That's the language. It's a win-win-win. The, refer, the, the person getting referred to you wins because they get to work with you. You win because you get more business. And the referrer, who we are petrified of offending, wins because they look good. You know, think about that chiropractor example. Whenever you hesitate to ask for a referral, think about that chiropractor example. How people trip over themselves. Arguing for their guy. Literally arguing. So that you use their guy. So people are happy to refer business to us. If only it, it blows my mind that I am teaching, you know, multi-hundred million dollar companies to use the damn phone. <laughs> it, it's almost embarrassing to, to, to try to wrap your mind around it. I can't believe that. Right? How are you a two hundred million dollar business and your people are on the phone for two hours a day? What the hell is that? Two hours a week, excuse me, two hours a week. Imagine what you could be if they were on the phone for 20 hours a week like you thought they were a second ago. I mean, what size would your company be, dude? This is your family's legacy here, right? This grandpa started the business. Think about what we're talking about. It's too important not to know, and it's too important to have your people on the phone for four hours a week. He said, success doesn't come unless you do the, same, the right things every day, the right things consistently every day. So my, well, I, well not, I, I study this in my own business. My stuff in my business is uh, my right thing every day is uh, a certain number of proactive communications every week. So at the start of every week, I, I make it a point to make 20 to 30 proactive communications with people who can buy from me every week. And I log it. I write by hand, because I like to write by hand. Um, I keep a log.
And I know that if 20 to 30 people who are customers hear from me uh, every week, that my business has no choice but to grow. I run a million and a half dollar business by myself. I have no admin, I have, I have me at my desk in my den on my first floor. And when my phone rings, my phone actually rings. Nobody picks it up for me. Um, and people say, well, how busy are you? How much do you travel? Not much. I travel 20% of my time, 25% of my time. Um, I work 40 or 45 hours a week. That's it. I have more capacity. I can, I can do more. If I want to run $2 million, I could. Um, so, so figure out what your um, key action is and how much of it you have to do. And ideally, it's quick and free and easy. Your, your rate determining action, what is it? The handwritten note, again, speaking about communications. Do you remember, everybody here should remember, except for maybe you. Um, you, could, you could walk down the airplane and um, after, you know, people are flying home on an airplane, maybe you. Um, and you'd see people writing handwritten notes on the airplane. There was a day when people did that. And uh, what do you see now when you walk down the airplane? You see people typing with their thumbs. Right? And so email has replaced the handwritten note. Again, it's another thing that kind of blows my mind that I, I get to teach and get paid for. <laughs> Teaching people to write handwritten notes. But I gotta tell you, um, I got a handwritten note about two years ago. Still have it, still on my desk. Yeah. Can't throw it away. I've moved houses. I've moved. I've bought a new desk for the new house. And it came out of the box and went back on my desk. I was done with it 30 seconds after I read the thing. So, so no. Nice to see you, you know, talk, mention a few things. Can't throw it away. The email has gone how quickly? Sometimes it never gets there. Sometimes it goes straight to spam, right? <laughs> right? It's never there at all. The Facebook and Twitter crap that goes out now is there for half a second and it's gone off the screen. Uh, the handwritten note is there for a long, long time. And I tell you, I, I end every week with a handwritten note, every week. Uh, and I, I sent three to five of them. Because I like pens, I'm a fountain pen nerd. So I have some pens and I have some inks and I have some papers and I, I enjoy that, it's a hobby. And so it's a chance to write with a pen, you know, for me. And I pull out a pen and an ink and I pick an ink and I pick a paper and I sit down. And usually it's three notes sometimes. It's this five. actually means something to you. I mean, theoretically, to get a handwritten note, I agree with you, it has a shelf life and everything else, but you actually... Yeah, I like it. Yeah. I'm working on my writing, you know, keep myself entertained. Um, that's the key. It has to be fun. Uh, and here's the point. Almost everybody I send one to, almost everybody, uh, communicates back to me and says how nice it was. And thanks me for it. Thanks me for it. I have a client who uh, I taught <laughs> to write handwritten notes. A hundred and fifty million dollar construction manufacturer out of Minneapolis, family business, second generation. And we did the workshop, and then we do a couple of webinars after the workshop. Thirty days after the workshop, we do a webinar. Thirty days after that, we do a webinar. And then we do a half day workshop to debrief everything. And that's the end of the six months. And so at the half day workshop, sales guy stands up and says, "I sent the note, and it saved the ten million dollar conference." So I said, "What do you mean?" Tell the story. He goes, "Well, we really screwed it up. We we made a huge mistake, and they were really mad at us." And rightfully so, I mean, we sent the wrong product. We screwed them up, right? We screwed them up with their customer. And they were really furious at us. And this is a $10 million account every year. And uh, he said, you know, once we fixed the problem, I sent the handwritten note to my buyer, my first. And um, the next time he went to visit them, he didn't hear anything. And then about a month later, he went to visit. And the CEO comes out of his office with the note. Not the person he sent the note to. But the CEO comes out with the note, brings it to the guy and says, listen, if you didn't send this, we'd be done with you. But he goes, this note made it from the person you sent it to all around the office, and it really assuaged some negative feelings that people had. It really helped, like more than you could even imagine. And it ended up at my desk, and there it sat for a month until he came in for the meeting. That's the power of a handwritten note. What do you say in the note? <laughs> he, because I asked him the same question, and if I remember correctly, he um, expressed his appreciation for them as a customer, he apologized again, uh, he let them know that he'll, he'll work his ass off to make it up to them in, in future business, and you know, it was, it, was a, it, was, it was half of one of these, you know, it was, yeah. 
this was the size of the paper, because I asked him all these things. Um, so how long did it take? It was three minutes. I said, how much of that 10 million do you make? Do you get to keep? You know? It's a pretty cool handwritten note. So right now, people will bring it up to me. When people say to me, I never hear from the people I send them to, I say, what do you write in the notes? Are you asking for business? And they say, yeah, I'm asking for business. I'm asking for sales. Don't ask for business. Don't ask them for anything in the note. Just express appreciation. Be grateful for something. Bring something up that you talked about. You talked about sports, you talked about the Packers, you talked about the Bears, bring it up. Something personal. You're good at this. Um, number five, quickly now, the reverse did you know question. If the did you know question is, did you know we do X or Y or Z? The reverse did you know question is, listen, what else do you buy elsewhere that I might be able to help you with? So they tell you what the product is. What do you buy from my competition that I might be able to help you with? Because we both know you'd rather buy it from me. <laughs> and then you laugh, and you say, uh, one PO is always better than two PO's. So the reverse did you know question. Always in, within the context of, a, of an existing conversation. And number six is the percent of business question. You say, Tom, listen, what percent of your business do we usually do, would you say we get? What percent of your business do I have? The customer says 20%. So say, listen, I'd like to get that up to 30%. What would that look like? Give me 30%. We can start there, that's a good start. So it's an easy yes. They don't have to pull much away from the other guys. Um, and it's a small increase for him, but it's pretty significant for you. Right? If they're doing a million with you, all of a sudden they're doing a million and a half. And that's just one customer. Now you repeat. About a 30% success rate there. On the reverse did you know? One third. Uh, sorry, on the percentage of business question. What percent of your business do we have? Great for manufacturers and distributors. And then, uh, there's 12 to 14 of these that I'll teach. The book has 23 different actions. There's six. Um, and then we send people off to do it with accountability built in. It has to be accountability. So a prospect asked me recently and then became a client since. He said to me, uh, why do we need you? It's all in the book. I said, yeah, it's in the book. You know, it's all there. I didn't hold anything back. It's all there. So why, why, why should we pay you all this money? You know, a project with me, around 75000 to um, 300000 That's the range. Why do we need to pay for that? And I say, well, if you work with me, it'll actually happen. You already have a job. You're a pretty busy dude. You've got a job. And your people are pretty busy. And so, uh, number one, you're busy. And if it would have happened, it would have happened. Better. Number two is, um, it's what I do every day. You do your thing every day, and I'll never learn what you do. I'll never be able to know what you do. But this revenue goes, this is what I do. And so, uh, there's expertise that you're getting. And number three is, you're paying money for it. So there's a much higher chance you're going to do it. <laughs> yeah? You're paying for it. Um, and it's significant. It, you know, it's an impactful payment. And so they do it. By the time they decide they're going to do it, they do it. One more thing to persevere is, um, I realized that last year, more than half of my revenue came from companies that told me no first. People who declined and then became a yes. And this year, almost all of my revenue, I mean, damn close to 90%, is from companies that told me no first. So I got a check last Monday, and the meeting that we had about this project was last January, a year and a half ago. I just communicated. Notes, stayed in touch. Um, various ones of these, did you know? Got the business. So, no never means no forever, ever. You gotta know, it doesn't mean no. It simply means not at this moment. That's all it means, not at this moment. So persevere and try again. Try again. Uh, Martin Seligman is the uh, founder of Positive Psychology. Uh, still around the work, I might have told the story. 
which I think we made. Martin Sullivan, he's 80 years old. He was one of the, he was a student in the 60s, I think, maybe he was already working, when they created behavioral psychology. So he's one of the founders of all of behavioral psychology, which is the rats pushing the button for the food pellet and then learning. It's about learning. He's one of the inventors of learning psychology. So uh, in the last 10 years or so, he, he flat out invented this positive psychology field, which is the study of what makes people happy instead of the study of why people are screwed up, which is the rest of psychology. And we were speaking at the same convention. So um, he spoke first. He had a keynote, and I followed him right, right after. And uh, I studied the guy in college, because I studied psychology, and I'm fascinated with him, so I listened. I, I watched the talk, which I rarely do. Uh, and he said this thing that stuck with me um, years later. He said that in our research, uh, perseverance and resilience are twice as impactful as talent, as natural talent. So another way of saying that is perseverance and resilience are two-thirds of the equation to success. And talent, being good at something, is only one-third. So trying again, you know, back to the Thomas Edison quote, um, making the extra effort when you get a no, giving people another opportunity to say yes, uh, is two-thirds of the formula. That's the rate to turn me stop trying again. Let me ask you, when you, you said this year, 90% of your companies that you got this year came from no. Yeah. At some point during that time continuum of hearing no, did you do anything to change what you were doing? Only in my head. You know what the change was? That I realized that no is simply a step on the way to yes now for everybody. I just assume it's going to happen. I just assume that everybody's going to say no. Not everybody says no. But uh, I just assume they're going to say no. To start. And it's just, a, it's, just, it's just a step in my sales process. That's it. I used to get upset about it. Just a step. Just a thing that happens. They want to see how they'll react. They need time to wrap their mind around the cost. They need time to convince their employees that this is not something that, um, you know, is going to be terrible for them. Um, and most of the reason, and, you know, I, I know why they say no, too, because I figured this out. Most of the reason for the no is uh, their staff is resistant to it. So they bring their vice presidents and their managers into the conference room and we talk about this, we do this, and we talk about it. And they say, we want to change. And then the conversation is around, well, look, who's going to decide what happens to your company? You or, or the sales manager? Who's going to determine the fate of your family business here? The guy who doesn't want to do something new or you, the leader of the business? So we talk about that and we, you know, it's part of the process. Yeah, interesting. Um, just another step. Closer to yes. So the sports psychologist uh, has worked with a lot of golfers, including I believe Tiger Woods, although he won't admit it to me. Um, <laughs> he won't admit it, but he's worked with, with other guys that, that you guys will know. And he said that sports psychologists, that, that their golfers are the best golfers. When they do something good, when they succeed, when they do something that's successful, they have a, a physical motion that ingrains that experience and cements it in the, into their learning. And that's this thing that Tiger Woods always did. You know, this fist bump, his was under, and some guys do this. You know, some guys high five their caddies. But he said the reverse is also true. The best ones that have worked with sports psychologists have a different motion when something goes bad. And so when they hit a bad shot, and then you see them walking down the fairway, he says they ask themselves this question, is there something I can learn? And they either do or they don't. And then you'll see some of them do this. You know, get it up, or this. Or flick their wrist this way. And that's their physical motion to be done with it. It's over. So that they can try again easily. It's done.